Okay, and with that, we start. So on your tables, uh, just a reminder, you have the attendance sheet there. If you haven't signed in already, please be sure to do so. Um, on, the, uh, on the tables are also a handout uh, for session nine, which we are gonna be talking about worship. And um, we'll probably be talking about this and next week. And then the last, uh, the last topic that we're talking about in this study is going to be on end times. Now, just as a warning ahead of time or a disclaimer ahead of time, we're obviously not going to be, be able to talk about everything there is to talk about end times. Uh, it'll be just a brief overview, of course. Uh, but I think it'll be a good thing to, to discuss on, uh, discuss and, uh, and talk about. And if you are interested in more information on that, you can go to Pastor Tom's class <laughs> and ask him about it. Um, okay, so, uh, but first we have the, the topic of worship. And let's see, here we go, opening question. So at your tables, I'd like you for about two or three minutes to discuss with one another what is your favorite hymn, or it could be a part of the liturgy, and then why is that? Why is that your favorite? So think about it for a moment, and then you can discuss at your table, what is your favorite hymn or part of the liturgy, and why is that? Okay, we're going to bring it back in. All right, now hopefully you had some opportunity to share at your table. Uh, and we won't have time for uh, everyone to say something, but I'd just like to hear a, a couple. Would anyone like to share what their favorite hymn or part of the, the liturgy is? And why? 
Okay, we'll go to Mark next. Lori? I'm taking notes. So just a few notes. <laughs> um, a mighty fortress, and I may manage to incorporate it in any of my recitals because I'm Lutheran, and some of my recitals are not in Lutheran venues, mm -hmm. but I incorporate that into all my recitals. As yeah. Well. Is a signature piece. Mighty Fortress. Yeah. Wonderful. And what a wonderful message, too, that that brings to us. Yep. Absolutely. Mark? Lord, thee I love with all my heart. I pray thee ne'er from me depart. And the third verse is, Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abram's bosom, bear me home, that I may die unfearing. Mm. And, and it goes on. But but that's my, my funeral hymn. Don't forget mm. that. Okay. <laughs> I don't have a... Oh, wait. I do have a... No, I have a pen. Anyone else like to share? Does anyone have? Oh, Trish, go ahead. What a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah. All our sins and griefs to bear. Yes. What a privilege to carry all to God. In prayer. Indeed. Does anyone have a favorite part of the liturgy? I'm interested to hear what someone's favorite part of the liturgy is. Mark has a great part. <laughs> <laughs> can't help but say, Hosanna! <laughs> And, and Pastor Mark, uh, what does Hosanna mean? Pardon? Or Pastor Tom, what does Hosanna mean? Lord, save us and Lord, save us now. Lord, save us now. Yeah, so it's a appropriate prayer to, to sing. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that, of course. Um, uh, what we were talking about up front, I think, Kathy, you made the comment, there's just too many to choose from. And you almost need to go season by season, which is the wonderful thing about observing the uh, church here is we do go season by season and then can spend time enjoying all these great hymns. So we've had a lot of uh, epiphany hymns in our services lately, and that's been good. Okay, so um, we are talking about worship today and why it is we do what we do. So the first thing to realize or, or th uh, something that's helpful to, to uh, bear in mind is this wonderful Latin phrase, uh, it's, it's always fun to have an applicable Latin phrase. It, it goes, lex orandi, lex credenda. Now, in there, you can see uh, the word lex, which some of you if, you, if you've taken Latin, you might know that that means law. And uh, orandi, or, orans, is, is prayer. And uh, credenda, you see something similar to creed or confession. So what it means is what we do, or sorry, the, it means the law of what is prayed is the law of what is believed. The law of what is prayed is the law of what is believed. In other words, how you pray, how you worship, how you sing affects what it is you believe and vice versa. So what we do affects what we believe, and what we believe affects what we do. Now, this is important to keep in mind because so often the discussion comes up, well, you know, do, does worship matter? And I mean, obviously we know we should worship, we should gather in God's house, but does what we actually do in terms of, you know, in the sanctuary, does it matter? Or is it just the fact that we're there? Well, it does matter. Uh, it does matter. The church has always understood that, that what we do affects what and, and how, I would say, we believe, what and how we believe, and, and what we believe also informs what we do. So, well, then the question is, if we're talking about our worship, what do we as Lutherans believe? Well, we've talked about these things in our class so far, and that's why we, this is coming at this point, is we've talked about all of these things uh, in, in various ways, and in, in quite in depth, actually. And one of the things we've talked about is that our spirituality, remember this is from a book called The Spirituality of the Cross, our Lutheran spirituality invo involves both the spiritual and the physical the transcendent and the mundane. In other words, right, our religion is not about escaping this physical material world into some kind of spiritual realm, kind of like, uh, you know, um, Gnostics do, or uh, you know, so much of this new age spirituality, like the material world is bad, and, you know, the spiritual with God is good. The spiritual with God is good, but that doesn't negate the physical, 
our physical lives. In fact, God entered our physical lives to show us how important it is that he would come to redeem our spiritual as well as our physical lives. So we have the transcendent, God's uh, glory, as well as the mundane, our everyday lives coming together in our spirituality. And that is going to be reflected in our worship. Again, what we do physically, audibly, motions, words, actions, it matters. It affects us spiritually and vice versa. Our spiritual lives affects our, our physical lives, our actions, our words, our hymns, our confessions, everything. So that's the first thing we believe. We also believe that our faith begins first with God's action for us, not our action for God. So some religions will teach you, well, you need to make the first move, and then God will respond to you. Well, that's not what we believe. We believe that we could make no move. Scripture tells us we are spiritually dead without God's intervention. A dead person can't do anything on their own. We need God to come and bring us life first and foremost. And he did. He acted primarily through his son, Jesus Christ, so that we then may respond to him. So that's going to be reflected in our worship. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. We also believe that God provides us the gifts won by his son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, delivered primarily in his word and sacraments. So God said, I, uh, Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And he instituted several things so that we may always know concretely that he is with us, that he loves us, that he forgives us our sins. He said, the Holy Spirit I will send to you so that he may bring to remembrance all that I have taught you. So we just are so thankful for his word and so thankful that through his word, we receive his grace. We also have been, uh, Christ has instituted the, the washing of, of, uh, of us through baptism and the giving of his body and blood through Holy Communion. So these are the important things that we realize as gifts from God, God coming to us, again, going back to this second one, that God is acting first and foremost for us, and he does it in word and sacraments. So our worship is going to reflect the primary importance of word and sacraments. Those are the most important thing. Again, we'll, we'll flesh all this out, but these are the primary, three primary things, and, and there could be more, of course. Uh, but we, we focus on these uh, important. But going back, I'm just going to flip back a couple slides for just a second. Going back to this Lex Orandi, Lex Credenda idea that what we do affects what we believe and what we believe affects what we do. You'll see this. You'll see this as in, uh, in all different Christian churches and, and non-Christian churches for that matter, that their worship style is going to reflect their theology and vice versa. Their theology does reflect their worship style. So we have a Lutheran worship style because we have a Lutheran theology. Roman Catholics have a theology that affects their worship. Um, Baptists or Pentecostals have a theology that's going to reflect their worship style. It's not like you can just pick one up and go put it in another church. It, that, it just it doesn't make sense. It's reflective of what, of what their theology says. And so, um, and so it's just good to recognize that. And the other thing I wanted to mention here is that worship is not going to be centered around me or you. Worship is centered around God. And so our worship also reflects him. That's what our theology is, right? What we believe to be true about what God teaches. So there are some churches out there um, that often use worship as a marketing technique. Like, oh, if we have this style worship, we can get lots of people in. And so they revolve their worship around that person, that so-called uh, uh, person that's not there yet, to try and entice them in. Now, I'm not saying that churches shouldn't be welcoming to the outsider. That's, of course, our goal. But that's not necessarily what worship is for. Uh, now, there are things that we can do in worship to be friendly to the outsider. But remember, our worship is not driven by me or you or the person who's not here yet. It doesn't revolve around us. Our worship is a reflection of what we believe about God and what God is doing for us. Okay. So on that note, 
let's talk about what we call in the Lutheran church the divine service. So this is typically what we call our worship service. We call it a divine service. So in the hymnal, if you open it up, you see, well, this is divine service setting one, divine service setting two. In Epiphany, we've kind of been using the liturgy uh, from divine service setting four. Not sure if you um, know all those different settings. That's okay if you don't. By the way, in our current hymnal, if you were one of those uh, old-time Lutherans who were used to page 5 and 15 in the old uh, hymnal, that's now our divine service setting three in our current hymnal. So they've carried those traditions forward, but also introduced some other settings, some other musical things. So you've maybe noticed like some of the things that we repeat in church or sing, um, those may change from time to time. We try not to change them too frequently so that we can learn them and enjoy them, but usually seasonally we'll change that and so that we can enjoy the, the wide breadth of our, of our hymnal. But um, yeah, these are all just different settings of the divine service. And you'll notice that the parts of the divine service, they stay the same because those are important. Well, let's talk about this phrase divine service. What does that mean? So it does not mean that we are first serving the divine. We first serve the divine. This does not mean we first serve the divine. And by the way, who's the divine? God, yep. But that the divine God first serves us. That's what we first recognize in the divine service. We call it that because it's God first serving us. Think about just this Bible verse for a moment. This is shortly before Jesus is going to the cross and he's sitting at the table with the disciples, the table where he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he says, for who is greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? What's the answer to that? Who's greater? Who, who, who's greater, the one at the table or the one who serves? <laughs> you guys are such good Christians. The answer is the one at the table. I mean, if you're talking about a worldly sense, it's the one at the table who's greater, right? But like I said, you're good Christians. You know what Jesus is getting at. And he says, is it not the one who reclines at table? Because that's what the world would say, right? The one who serves is, is the one who serves. But I am among you as the one who serves. And so we remember that when Jesus was first teaching this, he, he says elsewhere, uh, the one who is first shall be last, the one who is last who shall be first. This is unorthodox. This is flipping things in this world upside down. And not only is he calling us to be servants of others, but that he went first and is the ultimate servant. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to be our servant. And if you're saying, well, uh, that's, that's not right, You'd be correct. Remember when Jesus was washing his disciples' feet and he goes to Simon Peter, and, and what does Simon say? For, forget it, Lord. No, stop. I, you are not going to wash my feet. And then Jesus said, no, I am one. Uh, I am your servant. And then G Peter said, okay, okay, then wash my whole body too. And P Jesus said, no, Peter, you're missing the point. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what, what happened. But but Jesus came as the one who serves. And so in our worship, we recognize that, that God is first and foremost among us as one who serves. We, of course, have a response to that, and we have a part to that, but we need to recognize that it's amazing that God comes to us in mercy and grace to serve us. So we say that there are two parts of worship. We recognize his gifts, God's gifts, which are, of course, forgiveness, the word, the Holy Spirit, faith, and, of course, Jesus Christ. And this comes to us, as we've talked about, through word and sacrament. And then, of course, there's our response. Our response, which includes things like prayer and praise and singing and, and the confession of our faith. These are our response to all of God's gifts. Now, I want you to think about something. Um, I'm going to be drawing some similarities between Lutheran worship and other Christian worship, but also some differences. 
I would say that we are most close with other Christians when it comes to the response part. So if you were to ask other Christians of other denominations, you know, what does worship entail? I think some of the first things you would hear is, oh, worship entails singing and, and praying and, and us giving thanks to God and glory to him uh, for all that he has done. And, and we would say, yes, you're right. But I think what so often gets left out is this idea of divine service, that God is first and foremost coming to us. In fact, we wouldn't be able to offer a response if it weren't for God first coming to us. And so we need to recognize not only both parts of worship, but that that first part is the primary one, and it's the most important. In fact, we would fall into an error about worship on either side if we left one of those out. So what would happen if worship were only about all that we did? What if it was only about our response? What would be the error? What would be the danger in that? Okay, you wouldn't hear God's word. Because remember, God's word is a passive thing for us. We receive the word. The word is at work by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We're not, we're not first making that happen. We respond to it, but God's word coming to us is an act of God. What else? What would be the danger of, of just focusing on worship as our response only? Right. Yeah, if a worship service is all about our response to God, then it kind of becomes a law-based church, doesn't it? Whereas it's all about what we do, and God isn't pleased with you unless you do things the right way or are genuine enough or are sincere enough. So focusing on ourselves too much, or primarily even, is a danger. But there is a danger on the other side. What if our worship only focuses on God's action for us and doesn't include our response? Ah, very good. We call that um, uh, gospel reductionism where you reduce the gospel to just, uh, I can do whatever I want because the gospel's there and God's going to forgive me. So it doesn't matter what I do. Hmm, is that right? Is that how Jesus talks or the apostle Paul talks or James talks about? No, obviously not. What we do matters to God. And there is something that's either appropriate or not appropriate. So you see, either way you fall, there's an error. You need both. And, and if you haven't gathered from this course yet, I hope you have, but here's just another example of, you know, a lot of, a lot of times the errors that we might see in, in Christianity happens when you lose the tension between two things, right? We talk about law, gospel, we talk about justification, sanctification, we talk about, you know, all sorts of things. Um, in this case, God's gifts and our response. You got to hold the tension between the two. You got to keep both simultaneously there. Otherwise, you're going to start to trend into an error on one side or the other. So let me pause there. Questions or comments? Is there anything that, what is the most important thing that, that must be a part of every one of our worship services? Well, um, we're going to come to our worship service in specificity a little bit later um, because there are some things that guide why we have what we have. But I'll just to answer your question now, because I'm, you know, we may or may not get to it today. We'll definitely get to it next week. Um, it, it is really these two things. Um, and, and like we talked about earlier, that we are there to gather around God's word and sacraments. And, and we recognize that the divine is first coming to serve us, but the divine service is also then us responding and serving the divine. So I would say these two parts of worship, whatever form, and we're going to talk about the form later, uh, needs to include those two parts. A clear understanding that God is coming to us uh, to deliver forgiveness, to deliver grace, to deliver the Holy Spirit and faith, and, and then a response to that um, our response to his grace. So 
Um, well, I know why some churches do it. Um, so some churches don't like to talk about sin because it's a bummer and it um, isn't a great magnet <laughs> for people. And, uh, and, and they might be right. Um, it's, it, 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 if you've never been to a Christian church and you walk in and you hear us say, I, a poor, miserable sinner, and they go, wait a minute, is that, are, are you talking about me? Um, that can sound kind of odd. Of course, with teaching, we understand that, that the Bible says, you know, we are all with sin and need to confess and receive then God's forgiveness. Um, other churches, I, I will give them the benefit of the doubt, they may not just realize how important that is to confess our sins, as 1 John says, and he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we recognize that as just, and that's why it's right at the beginning. We recognize that we stand here now ready to receive God's gifts to us, and then afterwards respond to him in praise, we have to realize how it is we're even standing there in the first place. And that's what confession and absolution leads us to do. We are sinners, but we are forgiven sinners by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ken. Um, when I was really young, um, we had a vicar, and he uh, would always talk about the Holy Spirit he said that um, so frequently we talk about Christ and we talk about the Father, but the Holy Spirit seems to be the guy who's left out. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that, you know, without the Holy Spirit, none of us would even be here because he's yeah. the one who incites us to want to follow Christ and, and God. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I was really glad when I saw it was up there as part of the worship. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Martin Luther, in his explanation of the third article of the creed, um, says that that's what the Holy Spirit does. He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies his church. Uh, the Holy Spirit, there, there's this nice, um, there's this, if you can picture it, I, you know, I, uh, I don't have it up on the screen, but if you can picture it, you know, if you think about the Father, God the Father, and an arrow going to his son, God the Father sends his son into this world to save us, right? And then you have another arrow. What does Jesus say? I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will bring to remembrance all that I have taught you. And we know that uh, we receive life by the spirit and the word, as Jesus says in John chapter three. And so what's the Holy Spirit job? He's to bring us back into the church to believe in Jesus. And then what does Jesus do? He brings us and reconciles us through his death on the cross to the father. So there's this nice loop going on within the Trinity, which we are now a part of. Uh, and it's it, and it's that Holy Spirit who's activating that within us. So you're right. The Holy Spirit is kind of the uh, behind the scenes guy. He's kind of called the quiet person of the Trinity. It's not because he's unimportant. That's obviously all are equally important. Uh, but he is his job is to bring people to believe in Jesus. And then what does the Father do? He exalt Jesus's name above all names. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay, so let's um, go on to the next part, which is the beauty of holiness. So, so this is an important concept to consider when we're thinking about what worship is. And we have this word holy or holiness to think about. The word holy literally means in the Bible, set apart. So God says, I am holy. That is, God is set apart. And that is the primary definition of holy because there is none other like God. God. There is only one creator. There is only one God. And so from everything else which is created, he is set apart. He is holy. But he also then um, uh, brings us into his holiness. And we see that reflected in worship. Psalm 96 verse 9 says, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, tremble before him all the earth. So holiness and worship go together. And again, holy means set apart. So what we do in worship is meant to be set apart from the rest of our lives. It is meant to be different. It is meant to be something that happens uniquely when we gather there. We would see this in the, um, well, let's, let's, 
move on here to talk about what I was about to bring up next. So the presence of God, his word, and the Holy Spirit makes worship and us holy. The presence of God, his word, and the Holy Spirit makes worship and us holy. Let's talk about worship first of all. So we recognize that God dwells in our midst when we're thinking about worship. Exodus 25, 8, the Lord said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Think about how important this was for the people of Israel. This is God speaking to Moses, and they make the tabernacle, which is the, the forerunner of eventually the temple in Jerusalem, and this was the movable tent that would go with them wherever the people of Israel would go, and God was leading them by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, and when Moses, God, said to stop, it would stop. They would set up the tabernacle, and there the, God's presence would be, right in the middle of the camp of Israel. And so his presence was with them, even throughout all their wanderings. Think about how significant that is, how holy that is. And his holiness would be on top of the Ark of the Covenant, where the two angels were, were seated there, right on top of the mercy seat of God, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. That was his throne, and that would be his place. And so they, they built, they designed the, the tabernacle around that space that was called the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And there was a veil. You couldn't go in there, because who could stand the, the glory of the Lord in that sense? But the fact that he was there and that people could see him, that was so important. They recognized that God was holy. And amazingly, he chose to be in their midst. The same is true for us today. God is in our midst all the time, of course. But as Jesus says, where two or three gather in my name, there I am among them. And we recognize that God comes to us in concrete ways through his means of grace, word, and sacraments like we've talked about. And so God's holiness is certainly a part of our worship as well. And, and here's what's amazing, is that God then makes us a holy people, a set-apart people. Deuteronomy 7.6 for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Israel was the set-apart people so that, not so that they could look down their noses at everyone, so that they then could be an example and a light to the whole world of what it means to live with God. And God's saying, all peoples, all nations will come to your light and know God as the one true God. Well, we see, of course, that uh, true still today. The church, God's people, the new Israel, us, we are God's holy people. We are the set apart people. So not only is our worship uh, reflective of God's holiness, but that in worship, we are made holy by God. That is amazing. We are also a holy priesthood. This is where we get the phrase priesthood of all believers. That was such an important phrase, an important uh, teaching point for the time of the Reformation. There was a priesthood in the Catholic Church at that time, and they were considered kind of the super Christians, the upper echelon, and, and all the rest of the people were just peasants and didn't matter as much and weren't as pleasing to God, and we're going to spend more time in purgatory for it, and, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and the reformer said, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible teaches. First Peter 2, 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, the church, the temple, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about us, those who have been brought to believe in Jesus Christ by faith. We are the priesthood. Now, this doesn't negate the office of the pastoral ministry. The church is made up of two parts, the pastoral ministry and the priesthood of all believers, and each have their important part. And it doesn't make one better or greater than the other. Right? The, the priests in the Reformation times weren't better than the priesthood of all believers, and that's what they lost sight of. But as the priesthood, as the believers of the church, we 
have similar roles to the priest of the Old Testament, right? Like Peter's saying, we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What does a priest do uh, toward God on behalf of the people? Like thinking about the Old Testament times. Hmm? Okay, so the first thing is prayers. So they speak to God on behalf of the people. Do we, as the priesthood of all believers, speak to God on behalf of all people, including the world, including our loved ones, including all those who request our prayers? You bet we do. So you have a priestly function. What else did the priests do in the Old Testament? Sacrifices, offering sacrifices on, on, for the forgiveness of the people's sins so that God would be able to continue to dwell in them. Well, do we need to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins anymore? No, that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the once for all sacrifice. But Peter and other places talk about how we live as sacrifices for others. Now, how do we do that? How do we sacrifice ourselves for others in this life? Jane? Jane? Yeah, putting others' needs before others. Now, if you might be thinking, wait a minute, how do I make sacrifice for other people? Well, what was it that we talked about in this class based on the, your particular walk in life that God has given you? Vocation. God has given you your vocations, and we all have multiple ones of those, where we live as spiritual sacrifices for others. We bring glory to God by what we do, we serve and love our neighbor like Jesus asks us to do. So you see, as the priesthood of all believers, we are living as a holy priesthood. God, through his gifts in Jesus Christ, has made us holy, and we have holy things to do. And that's the, that was the other connection, is, is the, the priests in the Old Testament, they had holy things to do. Those were holy, set-apart things. Well, God has given us holy and set apart things to do in our lives as well. And that's what made it in the Reformation such a radical idea, even though this comes from Scripture, so they should have been aware of this, is that they were teaching that really the only people who did holy set apart things back then, well, that's the priest. It's the upper echelon of Christians. But the Reformer said, but what God teaches us is that we all have holy and important things to do. And this, again, is going back to our, our topic of vocation. So the person milking cows, the person making shoes, the person who's raising kids, the person who's going to work each day, they are all doing holy and set-apart things that God has given them to do, and that is equally as important in their vocations as anyone else in all Christendom. Uh, well, according to our verbiage, a pastor and a priest is, a uh, pastor is someone who's set in the office of the pastoral ministry, and the priest is the whole church. We are a priesthood. Now, in the Catholic church, the, or Episcopalian or Anglican, they call their pastors priests, but we make a distinction. That's why we don't call our pastors priests, is because we teach that pastors are given a vocation to be a pastor, but all Christians are given a vocation to be a priest, a priesthood of all believers. But if you say that to a Catholic or an Anglican or an Episcopalian, you're going to confuse the living daylights out of them. So. <laughs> but then you can just show them 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. So you can bookmark that one. Okay. And then lastly here, uh, talking about holiness, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, remember what we were talking about, how important the tabernacle and then later on the temple was as the place of the presence of God. And then, you know, Jesus comes along and he fulfills the temple. He fulfills the meaning of the temple. No longer was God's place going to be limited to one place in Jerusalem, but that in him, the fullness of the deity dwells, scripture says. In him was the true presence of God. So he fulfilled the meaning of the temple for the Old Testament people and now said, I will be with you always, even to the very ends of the earth. God's presence in Jesus Christ is now with us always. He says at one point, you know, destroy this temple and I will 
raise it up in three days. And everyone was confused because they thought he was, you know, talking about the temple that he was standing in. He wasn't. In the Gospel of John, it tells us he was talking about the temple of his body. So in Christ's body is the perfect presence of God. And this relates to us now because in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So because of what Christ has done and because of the Holy Spirit who is at work in us, we are now temples. We are now present, the presence of God. And we reflect the presence of God to a world. You know, thinking about that, we should have no... um, Laura, you were talking about what it is to live a holy and healthy life, right? If we consider ourselves, as Scripture tells us, to be truly temples of the Holy Spirit, well, we should take that seriously and consider how it is what we do, how we act, how we are taking care of this holy temple that God chose to dwell within us. We're not going to do it perfectly. We are all sinful and fallen, but we receive God's forgiveness and we take our response to that seriously. So what we're finding, or what I hope we're finding through all of this, is that God's presence among us and God's expectation of what we do in response to his presence among us are holy things. And that's the point, that worship and, and our recognition of God's activity in our lives and our response to God's activity in our lives, these are holy, set-apart things. We, we, we have this holiness through us every single moment of every single day, but as we gather as the, the priesthood of all believers with your pastors, that that too is especially holy. So worship is holy, just like Psalm 96 had said. Now, thinking for a moment about what we see in our world today, especially in our country, not much seems to be sacred or set apart. And, and maybe that's just my opinion, but I think, I, I think I'm accurate in that assessment. The, the, the theme of our world usually means, uh, usually is just constant ordinariness. You know, you should always be comfortable. You should always do whatever it is you wish. You know, don't have high expectations of people. Don't expect that God expects highly of you. You know, there isn't much that we've lost sort of this sense of sacredness or or set apart. And, and it, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you wear to worship. It, it, it doesn't. We, we aren't made righteous because of what we wear to church, but I'm just using this as an example. 50 years ago, what did everybody wear to church? Men would wear suits. Women would wear their nicest, whether that's dress or something else. Uh, children would be dressed up. Uh, women would wear hats. You know, just all sorts of things. And, and please don't take this the wrong way. I, you know, I'm not condemning anyone for what they wear to church. I'm just using that as an example of our mentality as a culture has shifted. You know, you go to some churches and, um, and they actually encourage you not to dress up because they want you to feel as comfortable and at home as possible. And they purposely de- design their churches to look not like a church so that you don't think you're in a church. It's almost like a bait and switch or something like that. Um, and, and some churches, and, um, and again, I'm not trying to cast dispersions or looking down at, at people, but again, they're making you, they're, they're, they're intentionally making choices so that their worship experience isn't sacred. It has no sense of the sacredness anyway. And, you know, you, um, you can do whatever you want and be as comfortable as you can. That's their goal. Again, God isn't better or less served depending upon what we wear or what the church looks like. All I'm saying is, I think as a culture, we have lost a sense of sacredness that when we're entering the sanctuary, when we're coming toward the altar, which is by definition the place where Christ resides for our sake, we acknowledge that and we would do well to acknowledge that. 
People say, well, why are you doing all those kind of high flutin' things like bowing or, or uh, making the sign of the cross or considering that kind of a, a or having like a, a proper order of things that you do or don't do in the sanctuary around the altar? And, and it's because Lutherans believe, we all believe that God is truly there. Now, he is there for us, for our sake. And we take great comfort in that, that he's not going to smite us if we do something wrong. Thanks be to God. And yet still, my response should be, I am so glad that God is here. And there is an appropriate response to that. Now, there's no rule book based on what you can or can't do in church. Each person can decide for themselves what that then leads them to do to recognize the holiness that exists in worship and God's presence among us. But, um, well, I'll leave it there, but uh, worship is meant to reflect the fact that we know that we are in God's presence and we are also called to lead holy lives. Trish. I think i had been left behind. I, I, I've shared with you before my Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal upbringing. And the one thing all three of those establishments instilled, in, and there's five of us, five girls, give of your best to the master. Right. And I, to this day, that give of your best, whether it's your, your calling, whether it's... Um, your parenting, whether it's your uh, being a wife, whether it's your going, give of your best. And I had the hardest time, and I, I, please don't get me wrong, I'm not putting anybody down, hmm. wearing pants to church. And, and maybe that's just me, yeah. but I had the hardest time because my best, I need to give him my best in everything that I do. Right. And that's not always easy, but that, that just was burned on my brain. Yeah. Thank you. I, I agree. For every person. So, it, I mean, this comes back to stewardship and, and offerings. What it is we offer to God, recognizing first he has given us everything. And so, so we only give back to him what is his, whether that's our time, whether that's our energy, whether that's what we are wearing to church, whether that's our money, whether that's our, how we uh, conduct ourselves, everything. We, our, our goal is to give God our best. You're right. We recognize we will fall short. We will not be perfect, that we need his forgiveness, that we're not doing this to earn his love. It's just what is incited in us is a response to his grace and mercy toward us. And so our question is, we should give God our best. And for every person, that's going to look different, and that's okay. So each person doesn't have the same thing that they're going to do in response to God's love, and that's okay. And so I want to make sure you hear that from me. We're not saying that there is a, a rule book of, of what it is you must do to be a good Christian. That's kind of the, the law-oriented church. But all of us should be asking of ourselves, what is it that God wants and expects from me in response to his great love and mercy for me? So on that note, we're going to uh, close and we're going to pick up here next time talking about specifically the question, why do Lutherans do? So all this in mind, why do Lutherans do what we do in worship? And that's going to also get back to what you were asking about, Pastor Tom. Let's close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are first and foremost uh, your children, your children who have been forgiven by the blood of Christ. And uh, there's nothing that we could do to ever earn or deserve that gift, and yet you so freely give it to us. Help us this week as we live our lives in light of that gift, uh, shining the bright light of your love to others and glorifying you and your holiness by how we conduct ourselves and live our lives, knowing that when we do falter, when we do sin, we come back to you, our heavenly and loving Father, every single time. Thank you, God. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.